It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight for the second lecture in our three-part series, Reflecting Canadian Cultural Production in the 21st Century, a speaker series honoring 40 years of Canadian studies at Trent. So we're having this part of our 40th year celebration as well. And we're particularly fortunate tonight and delighted to have Scott McIntyre with us this evening as our distinguished speaker, a very distinguished speaker. Now, for any of you who are avid readers of Canadian literature, I expect looking out of the audience, you all are, uh, the name Scott McIntyre should be a familiar one. But if not, I'd like to take just a few moments to enlighten you. For more than four decades, since co-founding the Vancouver-based independent publishing house Douglas and McIntyre, with his business partner and friend Jim Douglas, Scott McIntyre has played an instrumental role in the flourishing and nourishing of Canadian authors and in the publication of over 2,000 works of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. Along with hockey and a spectacular landscape, Canada is also known around the world for the high quality of its writers. And Douglas and McIntyre has been a principal wellspring of this town. Names such as Lorna Crozier, Robert Bringhurst, Wayson Choi, Douglas Copeland, David Suzuki, Wade Davis, Will Ferguson, Bill Reed, Johanna Scripsrud, Richard Wagamese, Charlotte Gill, Carmen Aguirre. These are just a few of the many, many, many authors and prize-winning authors working in different genres whose work have, has appeared under the Douglas and McIntyre, McIntyre imprint. Scott McIntyre was born and raised in Vancouver. And after getting a fine arts degree at the University of British Columbia, he joined the publishing house, publishing powerhouse really, of McCollum and Stewart in 1967, at the cusp of a new renaissance in Canadian literature and Canadian cultural nationalism. And I think the two went hand in hand in that decade. Such was the optimism and energy of that era that after only three years working at MS, Scott returned home to Vancouver to co-found with Jim Douglas their own publishing house, logically named Douglas and McIntyre, which would remain a can-lit powerhouse in its own right on the West Coast, and home to a vibrant collection of aspiring and in time well-established Canadian authors, and then continue, continues to add to that collection. Apart from nurturing a new cohort of writers over the next four decades, Scott McIntyre also played a key role in promoting Canadian publishing both nationally and abroad. He led trade missions to Japan and the Netherlands. He served as the chair of the Cultural Industries Sectoral Advisory Group in International Trade, otherwise known as SAGIT. I think it's SAGIT or SAGIT? SAGIT. SAGIT. I used to say an acronym in search of a mentor. <laughs> <laughs> and he played a vital role in the development of the UNESCO Convention on Cultural Diversity, which has now been signed by over 130 nations. His community positions, which are too numerous to fully list here, include being a member of the Aboriginal Council, Ad Aboriginal Education Council of the Ontario College of Art and Design, serving on the Advisory Council of the Walrus Foundation, the Advisory Board of the Art Canada Institute at Massey College, serving as board chair of the BC Cultural Foundation, and as a board member of the Writers' Trust of Canada, of the Association of Canadian Publishers, and of Logos, the London, England-based journal of the World Book Community. Scott McIntyre is also a member of the Order of Canada. He is a recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal and of the Ivy Award for substantial contributions to Canadian publishing bestowed to him in 2012 by the International Festival of Authors. And if you Google personal space, Scott McIntyre, you will also be taken to the Vancouver Magazine webpage featuring a photo catalog of the amazing West Coast cultural and historical artifacts on display in the living room of his North Vancouver home. And believe me, it's worth it, so I encourage you all to do so when you go home tonight. Scott McIntyre's talk this evening is on the grand adventure of Canadian publishing from colonial roots to world stage, a personal account. After his talk, we'll have a question and answer session. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Scott McIntyre. I'm not sure what I'm going to do to follow that, but there we go. 
Uh, and I'm reminded, it's a, it's a Tom Stockard line, actually, that Judith, Judy Dench gets to speak in Shakespeare in Love. If you don't stop using my name, you'll wear it out. Uh, it was um, very gracious. Thank you. So, and I see we have a, a reasonable turnout. Uh, I'm not even sure what the rules are here. I'm going to be personal and anecdotal, although my what I'm going to do is kind of give you a, some, some sense of the, the arc of Canadian publishing from the 60s to now, rather than an anecdotal history of Douglas and McIntyre, uh, which I trust will, will trigger some questions. And I have to ask, Dimitri, where, where are you? What, what, are the, what are the time constraints here? I know I was told 30 to 40 minutes and then questions. What, at what point do people hope to escape? <laughs> well, you know, we have uh, uh, an hour and a half, that's the that. Yeah, okay, sure. Well, hello. Um, <laughs> I've done some of those things. So, as I said, what, I, I thought I'd give you a brief introduction to me, but I think that's been done. Uh, I was young and idealistic and had actually worked, worked on, a, on, a, on a book with a friend at UBC. I was a yearbook editor by accident, and then that became a hobby, and then that seems to have become a career. Uh, and actually, the guy I did this book with is, has now been published by Steidel, and he was head of the photography department at USC, so we were kind of had some interesting times. Through them, I met Jim Douglas. Uh, through Jim, he, I said, look, I, I don't know what publishing means, but I'd, I'd like to see if it might work might mean something for me. And he said, well, there are two great strands in Canadian history, for Canadian publishing. There is, there is John Gray at Macmillan, where the book is king, the book is everything. And there's Jack McClellan at McClellan and Stewart, where the author is everything. And I remember saying, I don't think I even want to meet John Gray. I, I certainly did later in life, and they offered me something. But um, I will tell the story. And it has, I, I haven't used it so far this week. But uh, I was given the chance to meet Jack McClellan, and he was in Vancouver, because we pitched him the book. He didn't take the book, which was wise, but uh, they ended up offering me a job. Um, and this was 1964, maybe. Uh, and, you know, Jack, famous guy, Toronto, flamboyant, all that. Uh, so I went timidly to his door in the Bayshore Inn in Vancouver and knocked on it. And Jack opens it. He's in his underwear. And the, this is a true story. The first words out of his mouth were, Christ, I'm hungover. I, 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 I liked him immediately. <laughs> uh, later on, we did meet. m and offered for me a job. And my wife and I, she's back there. And we got married and ran off. And McClellan and Stewart held a job for six months, which it, it staggers me. I mean, this just wouldn't happen now, but this was the 60s. So that's how I ended up uh, at McClellan and Stewart. Um, so really my background is, as is now clear, I'm a trade publisher. I've had some experience in educational publishing. I'm the author of a third of a grade two textbook, which I always say is the limit of my intellectual achievement. Uh, I've had some experience selling college. So I have a little, I, I know some, uh, something about the broader perspectives or the, the, the broader uh, ecology of publishing. But my passion and my experience really is, is publishing book books, publishing trade books and authors in Canada trying to contribute to, to this ed edifice we have been building for almost 150 years. And I guess we'll hear about that ad nauseum in three or four years. Uh, that was my passion. That's what, what I was able to do. And, and I think I'm very proud of what, what, we, what we contributed nationally uh, mm -hmm. as well as regionally. So my biases will become clear. I have white hair, which means I'm of a certain age. I value the book as an artifact hugely, and actually some of my background was print production, so that's one of the reasons that we tried to uh, we tried to adhere to very high standards. And I have very strong views about that. There was a time, my my I must say my great idol was Alfred Knopf. Uh, they did everything well: nonfiction, fiction, print production, uh, real colophon. They still they still a Knopf book will have a colophon at the back of the book naming the typeface and its lineage. Uh, only Robert Ringhurst does that, and I'll come back to him. So that's where I came from, um, and I've said I'll be, I'll be anecdotal. I may ramble. I have notes, but I don't usually follow them. So if I get lost, you'll have to forgive me while I focus on what I thought I was going to say next. 
So where did we come from? And, and I thought I'd start, because Canadian publishing, publishing internationally in, in the 60s, it you know, was kind of, in one sense, in Canada, it was really, it was, we were a colony still. Intellectually, we were certainly a colony. There was no Canadian studies in universities. I don't know how many English profs I ran into who would say, we will not teach Canadian fiction because there's nothing worthy. That was, a, that, and that, that lingered for quite a long time. So Canada, on the one hand, was really grade two. Uh, whereas internationally, it was kind of the, the last great days, I would argue, and I am an idealist about that, of the, the great independent publisher. Alfred Knopf had just sold his company to Bennett Cerf, uh, Roger Strauss and, and uh, Bob Girard were, Giroux were, were actually just kind of hitting their stride. Uh, Diana Athill and Alfred er, and, and Andre Deutsch were still in London. I mean, Walter Norreth was alive. I knew his son. It was, I'll come back to Frankfurt, but it was e extraordinarily seductive for an impressionable young man to, to kind of see the last days of that. I mean, Peter Mayer is still a friend. I knew Ian and Betty Valentine. It was that moment when you could actually meet and work with and party with these people. And I consider that as having been an enormous gift. In Canada, um, we were small, we were just struggling. I mean, publishing in Canada had historically been uh, dis distributing the books of American and British uh, principles. There was very little publishing, there was some. Uh, and and the, core, the core business model for Canadian entities was, of course, the educational market, which meant the Ontario educational market. And most of the companies, then there was Clark, Clark Irwin, m and everybody did it, uh, and that was the nourishment. Beyond that, there was, there was some trade publishing, but even John Gray would say, uh, to publish a trade book is making a decision to lose money. And it was a kind of an add-on indulgence. And that was it. Uh, yes, there was some poetry. And, and, and by the way, I mean, Lauren Pierce was at Ryerson. Um, when you think that right into the 1960s, the, uh, the most important Canadian, creator of Canadian books, in a way, was the United Church of Canada. I mean, name a G8 nation that has a church as its major publisher. Th that tells you how, how, how Canada was situated in the world then, and that wasn't that long ago. Uh, not that they weren't good books, but there was this gray sense that if you were Canadian, nothing, nothing truly great was possible, and we all grew up with that. I mean, I, even into the 70s and 80s, I would have American publishers say to me, "Look, Scott, you're as bright as any of us. Why are you tugging your forelock all the time? What, what's with you guys?" And there is that invisible uh, curtain. At, at the board that kind of says, oh well, you know, the real stuff happens there. And it took, I think it took a long time. I mean, I grew up with that. My son, forget, uh, and I think happily the country has grown since then. But Canadian publishing were ba was basically a kind of a backwater. And, and the, books, the books reflected it. It, and the other, I mean, the other thing was that the infrastructure wasn't there. It was basically, the Canada Council existed, but there was no real public policy. Uh, in 19, the, the Canadian Booksellers Association was formed in 1952. There were 35 independent bookstores in all of Canada, and most of them were stationary stores. I mean, that's the, that's the level. So there really wasn't a trade market. And nobody thought about export. Um, so it was, it was just kind of emerging from this, I'm a Scot, so I can say this, this Calvinist inheritance so many of us have. Uh, gray rock, not too much sun, and, and the, the writing didn't reflect it, I mean, the writing was there to a significant extent. And uh, in, into this, uh, and I'm going to, I'm a huge fan of Jack McCall. that's where I learned publishing. And when you have encountered that passion and that flamboyance, it's tough to shake it. It's not necessarily always a brilliant business uh, modus operandi, but, but it sure as hell is a lot of fun. And it resulted in a huge amount of, a lot of good publishing. So I think of the golden age, and you touched upon it, of Canadian publishing as, 
uh, so sort of 1965 ish to maybe 1985 ish. And at that time, independent publishing and what I would argue is real publishing, editors actually following their noses, was diminishing everywhere. And, and we're not unique in that. I mean, it's the case in the UK, it's even worse the case in the US. Uh, it's not the case in Europe, because in France and Germany and the Netherlands and the Scandinavian countries, they have retail, I'm diverting, they have retail price maintenance. So that when you have a healthy book trade and price protection, you actually have stronger publishers. And for instance, when Gallimard was up for sale, the French government just stepped in and said, you cannot sell a national institution. One wishes that that had happened in this country, as it did a couple of times in Ontario, of course, with Paul and Mr. So, I, but I would say, so for me, and it's not just because that's when I entered publishing, uh, but McClellan and Stewart in those years was quite a remarkable ch change. I mean, Jack, Jack was a brilliant pub publicist, brilliant letter writer, uh, and there was that sense, and I used to say at the time, going to McClellan and Stewart was like entering the eye of a hurricane. It, it seemed calm in the middle, and, but you knew you were surrounded by chaos. And that was the case. Uh, but M&S was beginning to publish up to, I think they were doing 70 books a year, and there was the authors who had always published internationally. Farley was published by Little Brown. Um, Robertson Davies was published, I think, by Macmillan, who was published in New York and London. Leonard Cohen. Margaret Atwood was first published by, by uh, Deutsch. Uh, Mordecai Richler, in, in comparable, in comparable Atta, was published by, by, uh, by Deutsch. So the writers were there, but there was not much happening here. And, and Jack specifically began to bring that back. Uh, there was a Canadian publishing a, a few Canadian publishing houses and publishers of great distinction. Marsh Honoré at the U, U of T, um, Bill Toy at Oxford. But think about this, this was all university presses or multinationals. And Jack kind of strode, in my opinion, I overstate, like a colossus, sorry for the bad shape here, through the middle of that. Um, and there was that sense that things were possible. And Hugh Kane, is Sean still, used to say to me, Hugh Kane hired me. Sean's father actually hired me uh, and used to say, you know, Jack, there's a hundred ideas a day and if, if you can fish out and discern the one or two good ones, uh, then you're choosing wisely and that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, but m and was, well, it was about risk, actually, and more than necessarily the bottom line and, and, and the price was paid eventually. Uh, but m and was, I mean, I think of not only the authors, but there was the Canadian Illustrated Library, there was partnerships with Weekend Magazine, there was the Carlton Library, which was an m and in those days, the new Canadian Library. I mean, every day, every season, there was almost a new publishing initiative dedicated to building a house that replicated the great New York houses. Um, and, and the books were there, and I would argue the publishing smarts were there. What wasn't there, of course, was the market. So that was a pretty seductive way to get into publishing. Um, then in the, um, really in the late 60s, early 70s, then you had the new, the feisty ones. You had all, I guess, <laughs> my generation, we were younger ones, all of these folk slash kids starting new houses because the writers felt the only way they would ever get published was to start their own thing. So there was a Nancy coach house, uh, and New Press in 71, and Talon, Oberon. There was this whole flourishing before there was good public policy of the small and the idealistic. Uh, and they would do a few books here. Peter Martin Associates, uh, as I say, Edgar, sorry, we talked, Jim Larmer. I mean, there was this whole gang, Dave Godfrey. Bill, Bill Duffy used to point at me and say, you and your Mar Mauers, Maoist friends. He, he didn't much like some of the strident in those days. Uh, the waffle was alive and well, and, and it was the new left. But, but it was about activism and publishing and to hell with established standards. Uh, and th that was a great kind of revolution in its day. But it was the 60s. Rochdale was alive and well. And, I mean, I, well, that was another time. So, so Canadian publishing was kind of beginning 
to uh, feel its oats. And then that also, and it was really chicken or egg to some extent, but that led to the creation of an association of independent Canadian houses, the Independent Publishers Association, which, which morphed into the Association of Canadian Publishers. And we, they, we, were young, feisty, strident, and felt that public policy should be essential in a nation that, that wanted to build a national literature, which, by the way, we did. And that was the beginning of public policy. And at one time, the ACP had, I think, by general consen consensus, the most effective cultural lobby in Ottawa. So we got the Canada Council. It went from project grants to the block grant system. Um, and in the late 70s, we actually, through much lobbying, and I could tell some stories, I won't at this moment, uh, got, got something called the, what was called the Book Publishing Industry Development Program, which is now the Canada Book Fund, which was about $30 million, to, to, which theoretically was a business program, balancing the cultural program of the Canada Council. But in all of this, and, and I think the Trudeau government actually had had the wit to say to a Quebec bookseller who became a publisher, George Lavage, a, a friend, his son's still a friend, um, passionate federalist, was brought to Ottawa to say, look, what, what are we gonna do about Canadian publishing? Because the Ontario government had had a royal commission in 1973, two fat volumes, they're still on our shelves at home. Uh, I mean, imagine a government in this country today saying publishing is so important to the, to the national ethic, to the national um, psyche, that we must have our voices and we must have a national literature. And that was a moment. It wasn't just the 60s. That stretched into the 70s. Uh, and Georges Leberge, after much, much discussion, basically said to his colleagues in Ottawa, look, there's only one way this will happen. They're never going to make any money. The market is completely impossible. Uh, you have to give them effectively artificial equity. And that's, it's never said in public, but that's what the, uh, basically all of those programs are disguised with fancy names, but effectively it's intended to be in free equity because that's, none of us had any money and publishing is a deep pocketed issue and you've seen that in the last 10 to 20 to 30 years especially with the growth of agents. So we have no equity base, no market, uh, and yet all this, this quite wonderful publishing of varying standards, I have to say. I, I, I think there was some pretty raw editing and designing, and the books looked awful, in my opinion. Uh, but, but, you know, it was, the content was there, and the books were there, and libraries were beginning to buy them, and profs were beginning to teach them, and there was this sense of, of something happening. And that's a remarkable achievement, I would argue, for any country. And it did happen. So we should never uh, forget that. The other thing then began that began to happen on the back of all of that, there were regional there were sales reps, so that authors tour, you know, the, the great joke that McClellan and Stewart was the national flog. Uh, and I, I put Farley Moa through many of those, Burton, all of them. So the authors would go out nationally. They would, and the media were fascinating. Books were a story. And of course, some authors were more outrageous than others. Uh, and that was all part of the theater. So there was this sense that books and writers were important. And, and there was beginning to be that whole kind of ecology that followed, which also led to, to a huge increase in independent bookstores. So you had, this is before the chains, and yes, there, there was W.A. Smith, and yes, there was Classics, William Elzak. I mean, but they were, they were not chains, they were assemblages of a few stores, but in every city across Canada. And at one point, at almost every place, every town in British Columbia, there, there was a good independent bookstore, not a stationary store, you know, not a drugstore with a rack, but there was actually, there were stores and people who cared about books and were learning about books and were engaged in the idea. And, that, and, and so you had, you had Mel Hurdy, of course, who became a publisher. And, um, you had Evelyn DeMille in Calgary and Vancouver. You had Bill Duffy in Vancouver. You had Nicholas Hoare, Shirley Leishman. And, and of course, the great, the great Beth Abelorn, who, who and, and, and her partner who started Longhouse. And whoever heard 
of a store on Yonge Street that sold only Canadian books. And that was, I guess, the early 70s. They're, they've retired to the Bell I haven't seen Beth in a while. But there was a sense that this really mattered and, and something was being built. And it was very exciting to be part of it. So all of this stuff kind of, kind of built one strength on another. Now, I'm going to keep an eye on time because you don't want to be here till midnight, I don't think. So what are we? OK, that, that works. Um, so in terms of me, I mean, I kind of catapulted. I, I joined McClellan and Stewart literally July 1, 1967. And, and, and that, was, that was not deliberate. It's not intended to be symbolic. But it was, we arrived, we were young, from the West. We honeymooned in Yugoslavia. We missed it. Actually, I'll tell a quick story, although I'm going to run out of time. We missed the entire six-day war. Uh, we were off the coast of Yugoslavia with Yugoslavia, with, with kids being silly. Um, and we, of course, there was no English media in, in, in those days. And we didn't, there wasn't a Herald Tribune, and there wasn't News, Newsweek at the time, and we did not speak Serbian recreation. Uh, we didn't know what the hell was going on. The first month at McClellan and Stewart, uh, Frank Neufeld, great designer. And, and when you think of Canadian publishing houses having had designers of the caliber of Frank Neufeld and Alan Fleming, uh, he was at the UOT. Um, our first, our first uh, month, Frank, but there was a cafe, a dingy little cafe at the, at the back of him, and that's not as good as Trent. And over lunch, I remember Frank Neufeld reenacting for us the tank wars in the Sinai using cutlery and salt and pepper shakers. And there was this, just, just a sense that you were part of something interesting. And, and of course, Frank and I have reminisced since. We all tell old McClellan and Stewart stories, and they get boring after a while. Um, so I was hired by Hugh Kane, and, and M&S was indeed uh, a remarkable revelation. I mean, it was, it, was, it was on Hollinger Road. We had bad offices with Florida ceiling windows, so it was like 120 degrees in the summer. Uh, that was the warehouse for M&S. Uh, you never quite knew what was going on. Uh, I had been hired to become part of the, uh, the Illustrated Book Division, which was one of the innovations that McClellan and Stewart was launching. And after the Lansdowne books, and there was a whole series of books published in combination with a very effective direct mail operation. But there I was. I mean, it, it was, uh, I did learn, is Sean, Sean, I did learn how to drink three martinis at lunch from your father. I, I hate to confess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was just there, and you know that was that was standard in New York. That was standard in other places. I mean, now everybody drinks water. Uh, I think it's a less interesting time, but probably more productive. Uh, but it was it was kind of quite a scene to walk into the middle. Of it. We were we were young. We were two kids in our early twenties from quote unquote nice neighborhoods in Vancouver, and the first big event. And I won't drag this on. Uh, that we went to was there was a, a sales conference. The sales conference was when all the reps from across the country were brought in and the books were pitched and it went on for four or five days because McClellan and Stewart distributed it with a little brown, Athenaeum, Pat Knopf, Alfred Sun, uh, Dodd Mead, where people would pass notes around the table saying Dodd is dead, uh, Lippin caught New Directions, James Lawson, right, U.S. Steel. Um, which is a, what it is quite a traditional way to build a publishing house is to have wealthy parents. Uh, but it was, again, to, to encounter this out of the blue was, was, was a, re a remarkable circumstance. And six months later, I was made something called advertising promotion manager, which meant uh, me and my department and I, we were responsible for all the publicity, all the tours. Uh, and that did mean working directly with Farley and, and Pierre Burton and, and uh, Peter Newman, who's still a friend, or certainly Farley is. Again, it was kind of being pitched into the middle of all of this energy and chaos. And as I said to Jack in the letter I wrote when I left to join Douglas and McIntyre, I, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. He wrote a very nice letter back, I have to say. So it was intense. It was crazy. It, you, there was a sense that you were building something special. And I guess we were a little arrogant about that. It was sort of m and it's the only one that matters. That wasn't quite true. But when, when you think of the publishing record, from, and Liam Moore, I mean, Ernest Buckler, and I once killed a bottle of scotch with Margaret Lawrence, 
on a staircase in, in uh, the Inn on the Park, which doesn't even exist anymore. Well, that was pretty heady stuff. And on it went. Um, and of course, M&S, though, was always on the edge of a precipice. And it was always virtually bankrupt. And I think one day I fielded three phone calls from different media people saying, you've been sold to X, Y. It, it was a pretty, uh, well, that, that was an unnerving time. But Jack always pulled it off. There are various stories about that. Uh, and it, but but you, were, you were lurching from, from fiscal crisis to fiscal crisis. I don't know how it was all covered up so well. It wasn't really. But there was just that sense that it was the 60s all over again. And it was very special. So there. After all of that, we actually um, left for uh, Europe. It was sort of too much too soon. And we ran off to Europe uh, for six months, actually, in 1969. I had an offer from Jim. Uh, that was, I was saying, you know, I don't know about this. I was a skier. And he said, well, come back west. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a job. I'll guarantee something. So I was guaranteed $300 a month. Uh, and I don't know how or why we were, I was able to be so cavalier about money and life. But we just said, sure, we'll do that. So we did. Um, got back to uh, then Vancouver and, and actually January of 1970. And there was this thought. You want to build a publishing house, you just build a publishing house. Well, of course, that's folly. Um, and that's how it started. It was, it, was a rather, it was a naive dream. And we were very pragmatic for the first decade because we didn't have any money and, and things had to more or less pay for themselves. Uh, and they did. And you know, we went, everything that happens in a small publishing house uh, happened to us. And it was, it was just a different time. And our first two books, and things have gone downhill since. Uh, we're cooking for one, which was a reprint of, of a self-published cookbook by a very feisty 85-year-old Victorian woman. Sold 50,000 copies. Uh, and a reprint of, of a classic of BC geography, the, the law brand BC Coastline, which we did with the Library of, of Press with uh, Mort Jordan, who was the head of the Vancouver Public Library. And I, I just want to keep an eye on, what have I done? Ooh, that's almost half an hour already. All right. Um, well, it went from there. And because we were really catch as catch can uh, and grew very gradually, we made alliances with all the regional publishers. Uh, and the books were not brilliant. Uh, but there was a business model that was kind of working. And the old idealism, actually this was Jim's, was sort of, to be one-third regional, one-third national, and one-third international. And in typical fashion as a BC-based entity, we were national, or sorry, we were regional and international long before we were national. It took probably 30 years before I would have people in Toronto stop saying, look, you sell your books on the other side of the Rockies. You know, they're lovely people, but it's, they're regional, and they're out there. And certainly that was the view of, of the agents for the longest time. So we went from there. I, I think the book that probably defined us in so many ways was The Art of Emily Carr, which I had commissioned Dora Shadow to do, a, a big art book to international standards on Emily Carr. And because Clark Irwin, they controlled the rights to the Emily Carr texts, we did it as a joint venture, and also because of the scale. And we published it in the fall of 1979 and we sold out of 30,000 copies in two months at $40 in 1979. If that same book was done today, it would still have to be $40 and you'd sell 5,000. Because the books, were fr the books were new. The fact that there were Canadian books and independent booksellers and media, I mean, a full page in Maclean's for an art book, go figure. So, but it was all this kind of, I, I hate the word synergy, and some of you have had to listen to that earlier this week, but there was this sense that you were part of something that was building. Um, so there, there it is. And then Clark Irwin went bankrupt, so we had to get through that. We'd been through three distributors go bankrupt over the years. And then we had our own spot of trouble. Um, and I would say from, from sort of 1990, well, we had actually in 1980, we took another jump off a cliff, which was when, um, when the BC Ministry of Education had a new social studies curriculum 
and they wanted a series of textbooks. And BC in those days bought grade wide. That is 40,000 of this and 60,000 of that. And, and we entered a competition. We linked up with a team of educators, uh, consultant Bill Clare, kind of. He said, oh, it'll be simple. You know, you'll get to do some trade bucks. You can do the illustrated here, and it won't matter. Um, so we linked up, and we entered a competition where there was 35 entries, all of them national or international but us. And everybody thought it was fixed. It wasn't, but we did win, and that became, it's still used in some schools, exploration social study. We did it simultaneously in French and English, grades one through six. And educational publishing, when it works, was remarkable, is remarkable and profitable. But I mean, those days also are gone now. And when we realized in the, uh, the mid to late 80s that, that we didn't have the money to keep doing this, we kind of started to believe our own press releases, which is always a great mistake. And as my son likes to say, the burn rate was extreme. So we sold it to Nelson Canada, which is now part of Cengage, which nobody seems to know that Nelson, which was Thompson, which was Thompson Writers, sold Nelson to Sen Gates, which is an American company, and nobody in Ottawa noticed. Well, of course they did. But you know, there, those were the days of, of ownership policy, the famous Bay Como policy, which was intended to nurture the base of Canadian-owned houses so that there could be a moment in time when the Canadian-owned sector became even dominant. That was at one point. Uh, you'll chuckle at this. That was Richard Sturzberg when he was ADM of Heritage, I guess the old Department of Canadian Communication, before he did what everyone feels he did to the CBC. So in all of that, that we published, I mean, I'm very proud of that. And, and look, I can go on and drop names, but certainly the, pub, the authors we published and or who, whose careers we launched and certainly, Jim, you named some of them. I mean, Will Ferguson, who was very gracious at the end. But people go on, because the minute you make them a success in a day of agents, the agents will shop the next proposal, and one of the multinationals will pay double or triple, and that's the end of it. And that, that's just the game, the, the way it's played, which is good for writers. I mean, one has to say that. Uh, but some of the names you'll know. I mean, Sheila Grant, uh, Major General Lou McKenzie, peacekeeper, was us. Uh, I like that guy a lot. Uh, Hugh Brody, J.B. McKinnon, uh, Carmen Aguirre, we, we, which won Canada Reads, uh, the Johanna Skids Group, which we licensed by, from Gasparo, which was a wonderful story, and it's a different story. Um, and a lot of people, all of Doug Copeland's, or most of Doug Copeland's nonfiction. We really started Wade Davis. We turned down a first book, and that drove him away. <laughs> it's, and these people became friends, which is also very special. And I do, I promised, um, Mark Dickinson, I would say this, and I mean it. In all of this, uh, for a whole combination of reasons, Haida Art and the Northwest Coast Art, which I think is, is far and away one of the greatest arts on the planet. Uh, and Haida Art is kind of the equivalent of, of the classicists, whereas Wagyu Youth Art is the Baroque. But Haida Art is, is magnificently eloquent in an understated way. And I warmed to it. And, and Bill, we, working with Bill Reed, we did a number of things, which led to Robert Bringhurst working with Bill Reed, then doing his trilogy, uh, the, the <coughs> trilogy of the, the Haida, classical Haida myth tellers. I think Story as Sharp as a Knife, which was the first of those, and was fairly controversial, and still is, is without question the most important book I ever published. And it's magnificent. And th thankfully, Peggy Atwood agrees with that. But it, it was an adventure, and I cut that part of it short because things go on. And I think it's interesting that, that our list as an independent list kind of reflected to some extent my interests. So strong in First Nations and Native Studies, which certainly was resonant with what you folk do here, uh, and art and architecture. And one of the reasons for that was was that we didn't have the money to outbid McClellan and Stewart or Double A or Harper. So we had, to, we had to kind of get inventive in what we did. And people think, oh, look, that's wonderful. Art books are tough. How noble of you to do all that. The fact is that it was pragmatic. That's what we could do with the resources we had. So, and I could tell many an additional story, but I think we're getting 
we're getting to the end. I, I guess what I, what I did want to then talk about Frankfurt, I won't go back there. Uh, the, the evolution of Canadian publishers as a force at Frankfurt, significantly because of the writers, although of course with agents you seldom, you seldom got the international rights. Um, one of my great uh, satisfactions was, was knowing, being part of the Frankfurt scene, first, everybody's there. I mean, I used to say it's, it's 80,000 publishers floating on a sea of their own height. It, I mean, you work all day, very intense meetings, every half hour for 10 to 12 hours, then you party all night, then you go back and do it again the next day. But everybody is there, and there is that sense of the international community of publishers, and that certainly was a large part of, of, of my motivation and having become part of that over the years was very special. I'm really truncating this stuff now. Um, and when, I, when we first went to Frankfurt in 1969, and that was still, the American Army was there and the area around the train station, if anyone even know it, it was pretty raunchy. It was Drug City and it was raunchy. Um, and that's a long time ago. But what was my point? It was even being there was exciting, and that year was the first year that, that Canada had had a stand as a nation independent of the UK, and that's 1969. I mean, again, that's the extent of our colonial shadow for the longest time. I do think it's gone now. So the winds have changed. I mean, what, what, clearly what is happening now, and you read endless stories about the death of publishing and all of that stuff. And, and some of you have, alas, had to hear this before, but one of my story, my favorite stories is, and it's a bromide in publishing, that the first book Gutenberg ever did was the Bible. The second book he did was a screed on the death of publishing. So it really has, you know, there's always the book is dead, it's not gonna work. And now there's Apple and now there's digital and this book in CD-ROM was, was the flavor of the month 10 years ago. And the international, the multinationals wrote off hundreds of millions of dollars of having tried to do CD wrong, and of course the world moved faster. But I think that this is a period of great change. I have more optimistic thoughts to finish with. Uh, I can't read that. That's all right. uh, but it's I mean, one of the the interesting things now is what the Canadian ecology created. What, what sort of all of us did, primarily simply lured the major houses to Canada, who have deeper pockets. And of course, they're run by Canadians and they do wonderful publishing. But it meant that the center has been hollowed out. That is, what used to be independent Canadian-owned houses of scale, of some scale, pretty much have all gone. So you have really a very healthy ecology of smaller houses. And that's not to diminish them, and they do very good publishing. But that thought that Canadian houses could compete uh, with the big guys is, is pretty much gone, just because of scale and because of dollars. And we, all of the success of that period of the, the golden age lured most of the multinationals here and had them set up publishing programs. And I, mean, I remember the, the head of Random House New York, who was a friend, sort of saying, so what do you think, should we? Random House was a very low-key distributor Random House Canada was a very low-key distributor of American product, forgive me. Uh, and he said, what do you think? Should we, should we do this? And I said, well, I, I have two things to say. I sure hope you don't, but you'd be mad, you'd be mad if you don't. And that's shortly thereafter they hired Louise Dennis, and she's come off. And hey, Random House is a very, well, now it's Penguin Random. That's a very classy operation. And even the fact that it's Penguin random tells you something. Uh, the fact is now the enemy is Jeff Bezos, the enemy is, is Tim Cook at Apple, that, that the scale has become so large and the book has become so diffused with, with, with e-books and the digital possibilities that the question now is where, where does old-fashioned publishing fit and, and how do you balance that? Uh, so the change is, is huge and fast. So as I said, you get the polarization of the market, lots of room at, at the, and when I say the bottom, that's not a judgment, that's smaller houses. Uh, what we have in this country is public policy, 
between the Canada Council and what is now still the Canada Book Fund, and we can thank the Deputy Minister for that because these guys didn't kill all those programs, and everybody thought they would, uh, but they didn't, and they have been sustained. They've certainly been maintained at the same level. And Brian Mulroney had a great one. You know, you guys, God spare me from the print people. Too much angst for too little money. Uh, and that, and I think that is a significant feeling in Ottawa still. You know, oh God, I mean, it's, it's so true. Just, let's just keep them over there. <laughs> and there may come a time when that, that uh, the pendulum swings back. But as I said, agents, of course, have changed the game because it's, it's about top dollar, period, and that's an agent's job. Uh, which means that, that the, the people with the, the deepest pockets get squeezed out. Uh, well, and in fact, the whole business, the other part of that is, is the ecology, if you like, of book selling. And we went from really quite good independence to chapters, to chapters indigo, uh, and the, the growth of the superstores. And the superstores, by the way, and it's Jason Epstein, who's a fabulous editor at Random House, New York, um, really articulated it. It's all about real estate. But the fact is, publishing should, publishing used to be a cottage industry. When real estate costs are as they are now, and that's why you don't have a good independent in Vancouver, for instance, and Book City in Toronto is closing, and there are a couple of other things closing. It, it's, you can't afford it on the margins books make. So the Superstore model built, and when Superstores were being, were being expanded, and the chains were being expanded, it was great. Because they had all this, it's called, they call it wallpaper. So you had all this wallpaper being bought to get to fill the stores. So it produced a wonderful bubble of increased press runs and, and you know, publishers have, have an attention span of maybe 24 hours. And when the numbers look good, it's fabulous. And when they don't, it's not so fabulous. But there was this bubble and it all, everything kind of fed into everything else. Now we'll see because the superstores are being either closed or the model's changing, uh, Heather's, cultural department store, uh, returns in 30 to 40 percent of what is bought all comes back. That's, that's the, the set underbelly of, of, of book publishing, which most people don't know. Uh, and that's still there. With mass paperbacks, it's 75 percent. Pulp, just uh, and try to persuade a bank that your receivables are good when that's the business model. And that has kept huge amounts of equity out of the business, in a business that needs equity. So everything is kind of in flux. I don't think digital is necessarily awful because first, ebooks are the new mass paperbacks. And you know, just as, as uh, radio didn't, didn't, I mean, television didn't kill radio, movies, or movies, I mean, you get the, the new technology, it triumphs, but it doesn't necessarily drive out the old. And I think just to wind up, because it's, I've done my bit here, uh, I could talk for quite a long time further, but I won't. I, I, I think at the end of the day, are, are, are books less, less dom dominant than they were, for sure? Are they as important as ever? Absolutely. And as you know, anyone who uses an e-reader, and probably most of you do, you can't annotate an e-reader, you can't find the page you were on, and, and I think it's a nasty little device, even the good ones. Now, that'll change. I understand that. And of course, the typography is ugly beyond imagining. <coughs> but a book is a pretty convenient artifact, still the best way to communicate an idea, still the best way to get ideas into all kinds of cultures. And, and a book has, I think, but look at my age, I think the book still has a, a special magic. Uh, it, it, it conveys something of history. It, conveys, it has, in effect, in its bones, a thousand years of Western history uh, with good good typography, decent paper, that's less and less the case. But a book has a kind of magic. And, and I think books are talisman. I mean, one of the things I would say to authors when they look at their royalty statements, I say, oh God, you, is that all you sold? I say, well, just remember that the impact of what you did has extended far beyond the units on your royalty statement. Sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't, but it was all true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think books will last. And we have created, we have created a culture that is envied around the world for its writing. And thinking of Alice Munro, who I knew as a bookseller for God's sake, um, 
Alice Munro winning a Nobel. That's just kind of a sweet way to end this. Or Irving Layton was supposed to, Margaret, Margaret Lawrence was supposed to, there was always a Canadian, Robertson Davies was supposed to be there. But that Alice winning that and the extraordinary outpouring of affection <coughs> from all of the Academy, that whole event, that, that's, that kind of tells you something about where we've come. And I think in all of this, after all the ups and downs and arounds and public policy and debates and blah, blahs, I think what we did is, it, it was never a business success, but altogether we created an enormous cultural success. And that's the legacy we should leave everyone. And that's why Canadian publishing matters. Thank you. <laughs>